Drug discovery in many fields is flourishing. Uh, Anti-cancer, uh, cardiovascular, cholesterol-lowering uh, compounds. Uh, in all of these fields, drug discovery benefits from the uh, enormous amount of knowledge about these diseases that has been accumulated and continues to be accumulated. There is a strange paradox in the field of antibiotics. The more we know, the less we are able to discover new antibiotics. There is actually a, a joke in the field. Let us get rid of all clever people, then we'll go back to discovering antibiotics. What is the nature of this paradox? In the 40s, Selman Waxman discovered the first systematic way of uh, identifying new antibiotics. Uh, he made an interesting, insightful observation that there are complex microorganisms, bacteria living in the soil, streptomyces, uh, that he suspected fight each other, probably with compounds that are antibiotics, and so he started systematically examining them. He would take a streptomycete colony, put it on a petri dish in the presence of a pathogen, something like a staphylococcus, and he would observe a zone of inhibition. The staphylococcus would not grow around the colony of that streptomycete. And that extremely simple method uh, was then picked up by companies like Merck and Pfizer and actually made them into what they are now. The Merck and the Pfizer's of today were based on that extremely simple observation by Selman Waxman. One of the first things that Selman Waxman discovered was streptomycin. That was the antibiotic that was used to treat tuberculosis, the first effective drug against tuberculosis, and Waxman got the Nobel Prize uh, for his discovery. Uh, and so, uh, there was the golden uh, era of antibiotic discovery from the 40s through the beginning of the 60s when all major classes of antibiotics were discovered. Uh, the aminoglycosides, to which streptomycin belongs, uh, the beta-lactams, of which the previously discovered uh, penicillin by Fleming belongs, uh, tetracyclines, uh, chloramphenicols, and on and on. And then, rather abruptly, the golden era ends. Uh, ends in the beginning of the 60s because of overmining. Uh, and it looks like uh, the fate of antibiotic discovery follows the fate of, uh, of any gold mine. In the beginning, there's a lot of gold, you mine it, and then once the gold is mined out, there's no gold left. And so that is essentially what happened with uh, discovery based on streptomycetes. Uh, people uh, were spending most of their effort rediscovering streptomycin and penicillin or other uh, compounds that were not useful. So then uh, the field decided to switch to synthetic compounds, focus on, uh, on synthetics, and that did not work out very well. And uh, the primary reason for that is because bacteria uh, are protected very well uh, from toxic things that penetrate uh, into the cell. So they have special pumps, we call them multidrug resistance pumps, or MDRs, that will take a compound, which is a toxin, and physically pump it out of the bacterial cell. And they do that, of course, with antibiotics. A very small number of natural compounds that evolved through millions of years figured out, if you will, a way to bypass the MDR pumps. They're not very good substrates for MDRs. But virtually all synthetics are uh, pumped out. There's one exception which gives us some hope, and that's the fluoroquinolone antibiotics. Uh, Cipro or ciprofloxacin is a typical example of an antibiotic that is not pumped out well by uh, MDR pumps. But that was long ago, that was in the 60s. So since then, uh, the industry and academia built very sophisticated tools for antibiotic discovery like high-throughput screening, where enormous libraries of compounds have been built, screened for activity against bacterial cells. Uh, up to now, I would say probably 10, millions, uh, 10 million compounds have been screened. No broad-spectrum antibiotic came out of that, and no narrow-spectrum antibiotic came out of that effort. Apart from the enormous problem of delivering something inside the bacterial cell, there is also uh, a formidable problem of dealing with dormant forms of bacterial cells, which are persisters. So all bacteria form a small subpopulation of dormant spore-like cells, which are persisters. They shut down their metabolism, their targets are inactive. In order to kill a cell, a bacterial cell, an antibiotic has to corrupt its target. 
the target is inactive, there's nothing to corrupt. Uh, and so persisters are responsible for chronic diseases, for relapsing uh, infections, and that's a, a separate challenge that needs to be uh, met by uh, antibiotic discovery. What I would like to talk about is, is two uh, possible directions uh, in which uh, my laboratory has been working to develop new antibiotics. So one of them uh, is, uh, is based on what uh, engineers actually do, uh, and that is design from first principles. You Ignore what has been done before you, uh, even though a lot of what has been done before you may be useful. And you ask, ideally, what is it that you would like to have in a perfect antibiotic? And you usually start with the end result. Uh, and the end result, in my mind, would sound like this. Ideally, I would want a highly reactive compound inside the bacterial cell. So then it will effectively kill, it will kill dormant cells as well. It will be something like, you know, uh, like bleach, uh, parasitic acid. Of course, the problem with that proposition is that in the process you will also kill the host. And now we go from sort of the f from first principle perfect solution, uh, we go to the question of whether this is technically feasible to deliver inside the bacterial cell a highly reactive compound sparing the host. If you want to have a highly reactive molecule inside the bacterial cell, you need to start with something that is not reactive and let us call it a prodrug. The prodrug enters into the bacterial cell, uh, is activated by a bacteria-specific enzyme into something reactive, so that happens only in bacterial cells and solves the problem of toxicity. Then the toxic compound kills the cell. One thing I, I immediately uh, realized when I, when I drew this very simple model is that I was reinventing the wheel. Uh, an antibiotic with this mechanism of action actually does exist. It's called metronidazole. It was discovered uh, in the 50s by accident, like all antibiotics at the time. It's a synthetic compound. This is, this is a rare synthetic compound that was discovered during the golden era. Most compounds came from streptomyces. Metronidazole uh, is uh, activated in the cell by nitroreductase, uh, a bacteria-specific enzyme, and that solves the problem of toxicity. It is converted into a reactive molecule, and that reactive molecule binds covalently to DNA, proteins, the membrane, you name it, and has the capacity of killing uh, persister cells, which are dormant. Metronidazole is also broad spectrum. It penetrates. Uh, and the reason it penetrates into the cells is most likely because it, an irreversible sink is created. Metronidazole binds irreversibly to its targets, so it cannot escape from the cell. And over time, uh, it builds up. And it doesn't matter that it does not kill cell in one second. Uh, it kills it, let's say, in 10 or 20 minutes, but faster than the cell has an ability to divide. Metronidazole is a wonderful antibiotic. Uh, but uh, we still have infectious diseases, uh, unfortunately. And that is because nitroreductase that activates metronidazole is only present in a small number of bacteria that live under anaerobic or microaerophilic conditions, like H. pylori that lives in the stomach and causes peptic ulcer. In the 50s, several compounds like metronidazole related to it uh, have been discovered. And when I looked at uh, the history of discovery uh, of these compounds, uh, I learned that the last one that was discovered in 1959. Here's a discovery paradox. What is it exactly that happened in 1960? Uh, the number of synthetic compounds that we interrogate as potential antimicrobials went from 10,000 to 10 million. Not a single new prodrug was discovered. Uh, since 1959. What I think happened was uh, a very interesting and counterproductive attempt to improve our ability to discover antibiotics. What happened is that as the libraries of compounds grew, there were a lot of nuisance compounds in them, things that are detergents like, you know, soap uh, or DNA intercalators or, or other toxic molecules. And special validation tests were put in to get rid of such compounds. And the first validation test was supposed to get rid of compounds that do not hit a specific target. 
And of course, that's what the prodrugs are. They do not hit a specific target. That is the beauty of the prodrug. Specificity comes not because it hits a target that we do not have, but because bacteria have an activating enzyme that we do not have that activates the prodrug into a reactive molecule. It's a different principle. And so I think this is the case when the, the child was thrown out together with the water. So the last 50 years, the industry has been throwing away prodrugs. So here is one uh, interesting opportunity to go back to the golden uh, era of discovery and uh, discover the missing prodrugs. And so that is one thing that my lab is doing. We have a screen for prodrug-like compounds, and we are discovering the missing prodrugs. The other thing that I would like to uh, tell you about uh, is uh, the opportunity to go after a new source, a relatively untapped source, uh, a new mine, if you will, and that is uncultured bacteria, uh, where about 99% of all bacteria in the biosphere do not readily grow in the lab. A number of years ago, we developed some general methods to grow uncultured bacteria. It's based on a very simple principle uncultured bacteria will grow in their natural environment. And so using a diffusion chamber, we place them back in their natural environment, trick them into perceiving it as their uh, uh, habitat, uh, and then uh, most of uncultured bacteria grow. So using that as an untapped source, we can then ask the question, do they make new compounds? And they actually do. We're collaborating with a biotech company, uh, Nova Biotic that uses that uh, invention as their core technology and has discovered a number of very interesting new classes of uh, antibiotics, some in uh, advanced preclinical development. So I think that the future uh, of antimicrobial discovery looks bright. We are tapping into uncultured bacteria. That will definitely help. We are discovering the missed prodrugs. And there's another opportunity, and that is to crack the permeability uh, problem. So uh, one opportunity is to come up with rules of penetration. What is it about those rare molecules that Mother Nature uh, made and the fluoroquinolones that made them penetrate well, avoiding MDR pumps? Uh, by measuring penetration of a large libraries of compounds, we are looking into rules of penetration. Once those are formulated, we can now make new libraries of compounds that will be focused to antibiotic discovery.